Yeah, we're, we're already seeing some uh, independent currencies that are backed by gold starting to become popular. I've read about a few articles online of people starting up their own currencies. Uh, moving on to a question from Caitlin Zinsley. She's a leader of one of the more liberal clubs at our school. She asked, how are markets supposed to account for the gap between the rich and the poor? Okay, now I don't, I don't know what she means by account for. I mean, does she mean deal with, do you think? Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, uh, Yeah, I mean, okay, well, part of my answer is look in, at those countries in the world where the gap between the rich and the poor is the widest. And those are the countries that are the farthest away from the free market. That's always the case. I mean, you know, in the Soviet Union, the apparatchiks did very, very well. The average person uh, suffered tremendously. Look at, look at Africa. I mean, you've all, the only places in Africa where you've got anything approaching a free market would be Botswana. And by the way, Botswana, here's a big surprise, Botswana is one of the richest countries in Africa. Big, big surprise there, right? Uh, South Africa, well, you know, it's kind of a mess right now. But, I mean, you can find isolated pockets of the free market. But otherwise, it's a bunch of extremely, you know, it's just awful dictators uh, who have a free market. Come on. I mean, these, they just run the countries the way, the way they want, and they've got magnificent palaces while everybody else is eating dirt. In fact, if you look at the countries of the world and you just want to see in what countries are the poorest people doing the best, which countries, so to speak, have the richest poor, they are always the free market countries. Would you rather be poor in Bangladesh or would you rather be poor in Hong Kong? And this, this holds true consistently as a rule. So it seems to me that if we genuinely care about the poor, I mean, look, I don't, if somebody has three yachts in a free market society, that doesn't affect, that doesn't hurt me any. He's not stealing them from me. I didn't have them to start with, I assure you. That's, you know, if we can just set envy aside for five seconds and actually demonstrate a real concern for people who are poor, we would not consign them to systems that have made the poor worse off. Even if you look at so-called third-way European welfare states like Sweden, uh, American blacks on average are richer than the average Swede. And American blacks are not doing as well uh, as some other groups in America, and yet they are doing better than, than Swedes in general. So if you really care about the well-being of the poor, you would want to adopt the, the system that provides for their material well-being better than any other system. Whereas if all you care about is seeming to care about the poor, uh, you know, then sure, you know, then, then quash the market economy, destroy wealth creation, and make everybody you know, at the same poor level, and then you'll be successful, then everybody will be poor. But I, I guess I just I find it hard to believe that people genuinely care about the welfare of the poor and then can't be bothered to look up the actual facts. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, uh, another question is from Matt from Syracuse. Um, he says, on a, on a virtual level, uh, the Austrian business cycle theory makes complete sense, but when you consider it with respect to the recent crisis, it's a bit harder to put the pieces together. Specifically, the Austrian business cycle holds the capital goods industries that are most affected by both the artificial boom and the subsequent bust, yet it was housing that was the prime player in today's crisis, not exactly a capital good. How does the Austrian business cycle deal with this? <coughs> well, I guess well, part of the answer um, is, is that, I mean, housing is at the very least an extremely durable consumer good. But secondly, it's not just housing that's going to ultimately bust, it's also going to be commercial real estate, that is the buildings in which uh, businesses operate. Or a lot of times businesses will have, will have built an addition, or they will have built a second, a second building for a second branch of the business. And that is arguably, in fact, Gerald Salenti makes this point, that's actually going to be a worse bust than residential households are, are, are going to be. Um, so that, that, in effect, reinforces Austrian business cycle theory, that the more capital-intensive will get hit harder. Well, the more capital-intensive type of, of, resi of, of, uh, of building projects, the commercial real estate market, will, is, in fact, going to wind up being hit harder than just regular residential real estate. So, so there's that. But also, I mean, remember that how are people financing this real estate? How are, they, how are people going out and buying a house? Well, they're buying it with, you know, basically with this 30-year mortgage uh, thing, which is, 
which is in itself partly a government intervention. I mean, most people in the 30s didn't own their own homes. Uh, nobody would lend to you for 30 years because you can never tell what inflation is going to do and so on and so forth. So this this sort of long-term type of an, of, uh, of an expenditure is very interest rate sensitive, unlike consumer goods like um, toothbrushes or hats or, or potato chips. A house is a, is a large, durable purchase that is paid for over a long span of time. So I think that does, in fact, um, still make it qualify as something that would be artificially encouraged by artificially low interest rates. Because, of course, if the interest rate is 21%, imagine what a 30-year mortgage would amount to. Whereas if the interest rate comes down to 4 or 5%, you're much more likely to take out that 30-year uh, that 30-year mortgage. So, the point is that it's long-term things that are most that tend to be the most interest rate sensitive, where you will see the biggest busts. And as I say, commercial real estate is going to be hit harder. But given that housing is a long-term project of paying it off, uh, and it's very very interest rate sensitive, well, naturally that would act, that the uh, Austrian theory would. Uh, it, uh, it can be conformed to this idea that you've had a boom in residential housing. Well, definitely okay. one of the best um, uh, things I've ever heard about the Austrian theory was that you know it encourages production and savings besides not this kind of artificial consumption and you know take as, buy as much as you can because the businesses are dying. I mean, how much more can we buy? We've been buying for so long. I mean, how much more do they want us to do? How much more debt do they want the American people to have? Right, and and I've got an article coming out in the Campaign for Liberty site um, sometime this week sort of explaining this, because I know that there is a superficial plausibility to the idea that people should spend because, you know, how can businesses stay in business if people don't spend? And there are a lot of different replies to that. But one that's relevant to today is, uh, as you say, it, it's not spending per se that we need, because if that were the case, everybody should get into debt up to his eyeballs, as a lot of people already are, uh, and then go out and spend. But then, you know, well, then what will we do three weeks from now when we're so in debt that we can't spend any more? I mean, this, the, obviously that can't be the solution in and of itself. But beyond that, the fact is that because of the housing boom, people spent more than they should have. They thought they were richer than they really were because everybody thinks he's sitting on a half-million-dollar house. Now they realize they're not, and now they realize they've engaged in more consumption spending than they should have, or they borrowed against the equity in their homes to finance consumption spending, and they wouldn't have done that if they had known the real value of their homes. So what we're starting to see now is that in the boom, it was not just housing that was affected by the boom. The boom distorts all, all lines of production, or a lot of lines of production, that wouldn't have occurred without the boom. And so, for instance, we're now learning that Starbucks – or at least it's one store every 10 feet business model, was a bubble activity. I mean, they are closing stores like you wouldn't believe because, yeah, when people feel like, hey, I got, a, I got an infinitely appreciating asset in the form of my house, well, sure, a five-buck cup of coffee, yeah, sky's the limit. Or a $6 ice cream cone with Cold Stone Creamery, great, you know, fine, let's do it. But we're now seeing that those are bubble activities. They're going, they're going south fast. And so... It's not so much that we need spending per se. We don't need people to go out and spend $5, uh, $5 cups of coffee. What we need is for the economy to realize, wait a minute, $5 cups of coffee are not what we need to be producing. We need capital to go out of that and to produce $1 cups of coffee. So what we need is a restructuring of the economy so that it produces things people can sustainably spend their money on. We don't want to freeze this economy just the way it is and tell people to keep spending. We're producing things that people can't afford. We're producing uh, more plasma TVs maybe than we should be. I don't exactly know what we're producing too much of. That's why we have a price system. But we need the economy to sort out what is sustainable in a post-bubble economy and what should be allowed to go out of business, and then we will restore an equilibrium where people will spend and, and will we'll be producing things that people want. But just throwing money at the existing economy is just going to prop up zombies. That's the last thing we want. On that note, oh, uh, that the Obama administration so far has spent tr over a trillion dollars, and God knows how much the Geithner Bank program could, co could cost. But if they continue on this path, what do you see happening in the next four years? Hmm. Well, I, I mean, if they continue on this path, it, it, I, I just can't see how the economy could recover. I mean, markets are incredibly resilient. And, I mean, they, 
the market was trying to recover in the early years of the, of the New Deal. I mean, there are some signs of that. So it can fight against government intervention. But given that we've got, you know, we've got no savings, um, you know, we're very much hollowed out a, as an economy, it's hard to see where, the, where the, the resources for the recovery could come from, given that our pool of savings has been stretched thin or is almost non-existent. And then what little we have left, the government wants to raid so it can spend on arbitrary projects to reward political favorites. So I don't see where the recovery could come from. So we could, you know, best case scenario, we degenerate to a uh, West European welfare state model where they have extremely sluggish growth, if any growth at all. They have uh, high unemployment, and, and they pretend not to know why this is happening to them. Or, or there is the possibility of, you know, the worst case scenario is a complete collapse of the whole system. Uh, a c c complete collapse of the dollar uh, with all this pressure being put on it. I, I think it's very hard to know which of those outcomes will happen, but they are both, neither one of them is completely implausible.